of moderate to severe Crohn's disease, SkyRizzy is the first and only IL-23 inhibitor that can deliver clinical remission and endoscopic improvement. Serious allergic reactions and an increased risk of infections or a lower ability to fight them may occur. Tell your doctor if you have an infection or symptoms, had a vaccine or plan to. Liver problems may occur in Crohn's disease. Control of Crohn's means everything to me. Ask your gastroenterologist about SkyRizzy. Learn how AbbVie could help you save. Monday on ET, a Beverly Hills Housewives Vegas residency rehearsals. This is a party. Erica Jane on her weight loss controversy and her love life today. We're just keeping that very quiet. We all be sure to check. Happening now. Last year, the Bear County Crime Lab said a new technique would help them cut the sexual assault kit backlog in half in just months. Coming up, why they say that hasn't happened. And incredible new video of a fire at a Dollar Tree store north of downtown overnight. The flames so intense, firefighters are still on the scene looking for hot spots. Tracking some energy moving into the Gulf of Mexico this weekend. It could bring us some rain. I'm going to have an update in just a bit. The News at 5 starts right now. And happening right now, a traffic at a standstill. They're moving a little slower along I-35 at New Laredo Highway this Friday because of a brush fire that broke out earlier this afternoon. Now, firefighters have since gotten a handle on it, and they're making sure that it doesn't flare back up. We want to show you the scene just after 4 p.m. You see a lot of smoke there in the air. That's from our Trines Guide cameras where you're getting that vantage point. It captured smoke billowing from the side of the road right over the highway. Look at it right there to your right. And commuters were just driving through that smoke. Yeah, a firefighter at the scene tells us besides the dry grass, there were were some old tires and roofing shingles that were also burning. The highway opened, but as you can see, the southbound access road partially closed as emergency responders continue to work in that area. And for a while, it was completely closed. Well, new at five, the Bear County Crime Lab needs help. It still needs to test hundreds of sexual assault kits. This is the very lab that tests the DNA in murder, kidnapping and rape cases across Bear County. Here's the thing, though. Workers there do have the equipment that they need in order to test the kits. So why the backlog and why aren't they further along? Daniela Ibarra went to the lab's director to find out. The Bear County Crime Lab is busy. They're also working the homicides. They're working the attempted homicides, the aggravated assaults. But the lab's director, Oren Din, says about 60% of their workload is sexual assault kits. It's a very important topic. It's a very sensitive topic. Last year, the county spent $167,000 to improve processing time. Garen Foster, the lab's forensic scientist supervisor of the DNA section, told us last September the new technique would make a huge difference in processing their sexual assault kit backlog. I fully expect us to have or decrease this backlog in half and the turnaround time, I hope, in half within those four to six months. Nearly a year later, Din says that has not happened. I think that was an optimistic viewpoint, overly optimistic. Din says staffing has been a challenge. There's vacancies and it takes time to train up new employees. This isn't about people not working hard. This is about resources to get the job done. Din says the county's investment has helped double the lab's work rate. The lab, Din says, has to clear a backlog of 455 kits. He estimates that's about seven months worth of cases. We're treading water, if you will. We're no longer losing ground. We're able to uh, meet what's coming in. As for the survivors of sexual assault waiting for answers, Din says he understands. Our first and most important thing we can tell them is we want to make sure the first thing we do is that we work the case properly. There are no shortcuts to that. Danielle Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. I want to show you some video from Drone 12 showing what is left of the Dollar Tree. This is actually on North Main Street in East Cortland Place near San Antonio College, or it used to be a Dollar Tree store. Firefighters initially called out just before 1 a.m. this morning for a fire at this location. They actually had to be called back out to the scene to put out some hot spots. Take a look. This is what the store looked like when firefighters arrived on scene. We're told as they were working to put out the flames, the roof began to collapse. The fire refused to go down quickly. Crews sprayed the building with water for hours. A city crew with heavy equipment was called in to assist, but the building could not be saved. The entire structure demolished. The front wall actually fell over at one point. Firefighters think that fire burned for a while before anyone noticed, giving the flames a head start. Fire investigators are now sifting through the rubble.
to find, try and find out what caused this fire. A San Antonio police are having a difficult time figuring out what happened before three men were shot last night. That shooting happened before 11 o'clock. Officers say the men were together at an apartment complex in the 700 block of West Mayfield Boulevard, right close to South Zarzamora Street. And they say that there was some sort of an altercation and then the bullets started flying. All of three of those men were hit. They drove themselves to a hospital. Two of the victims were in critical condition, one in stable condition. Investigators say that the men only gave minimal information about the shooting, so they still have a lot of questions. New information on a standoff where SAPD believes a woman was being held against her will. SWAT officers called out to an apartment complex on South New Braunfels Avenue near the DPS office, not far from Brooks City Base yesterday evening. The family of the woman told police that she called them saying she was with the suspect and was in danger. According to police officers initially knocked on the door and say they heard a man telling someone to stay quiet. Again, this is what police are telling us. SWAT made repeated calls for everyone in the apartment to come out. The woman and the suspect did eventually leave. The 29 year old man taken into custody by that SWAT team. Police say he had multiple outstanding felony warrants. From New Braunfels Avenue to the city of New Braunfels and police there arrest a man for allegedly assaulting two women at two different stores earlier this morning. 23 year old Ladarius Mitchell from Seguin charged with sexual assault. New Braunfels police say he inappropriately touched a woman at a Walmart on I-35 South then ran from that store. Police searched nearby shopping areas and say he was taken into custody at the HEB on South Walnut Avenue. Again, this is in New Braunfels. Officers say before he was found, he assaulted another woman in a similar way. Investigators believe there may be more victims. They want to encourage them to come forward. They're instructed to call the number on your screen. If you recognize this man, 830-221-4128. Now we've been talking to you about the fentanyl crisis and now new data shows the drug is killing just as many children as adults. ABC News' M. Wynn has the safeguards that could save a child's life. Since 2013, there has been a steady increase in fentanyl deaths in children and teens, mirroring that of the adult population. Data shows that 90% of pediatric fentanyl deaths were in teenagers aged 15 to 19. Most of these deaths were unintentional overdoses, many occurring at home. Teens who are using or experimenting with drugs face the same risks as adults, with the growing amount of illicit drugs contaminated with fentanyl. There are a few things to help protect children and teens. First, keep all medications and drugs out of sight and out of reach in the home. Keep Narcan, used to treat opioid overdoses, on hand if you think anyone in your home might be using drugs. And if you or someone you know is struggling with opioid use, get help from a health care provider. With this Medical Minute, I'm M. Wynn, ABC News. By the way, a lot of those resources and where you can get local help is on our website. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, we have to talk about something that leaders in Washington are doing. They're working on a bipartisan bill to decriminalize fentanyl test strips. The Texas Tribune says that U.S. Senator John Cornyn of Texas introduced the bill late last month. And if it passes, the measure would no longer label test strips as drug paraphernalia. The strips would allow people to test a drug for fentanyl before they consume it. It would actually make it easier also to get the test strips, which, by the way, are currently illegal in Texas. Supporters of the bill argue that it would save lives because people would know to stay away from drugs that contain fentanyl. Now, back to what I was saying before, unfortunately, Fentanyl has also taken lives right here in San Antonio. We've shared some of the heartbreaking stories of adults and children who have died because of fentanyl poisonings. Now, if you want to learn more about fentanyl, what it is, how to get help, where to get Narcan locally, just go to ksat.com and click on Fighting Fentanyl, or you see that QR code on your screen? Just scan it. It'll take you right there to all of our stories. Now to Maui, where we're getting a clearer picture of the destruction left behind by those deadly wildfires. This after the head of Maui's emergency management agency resigned amid criticism over his decision to not sound warning sirens, typically used for tsunami warnings. Uh, Herman Andaya said that he didn't sound the sirens because people were trained to head inland or toward the mountain when they hear them. And when the fires were happening, that's exactly the areas that they needed to avoid. ABC's Melissa Adan is in Maui, where at least 111 people have died and hundreds are still unaccounted for. 
New satellite images showing the destruction in Lahaina. Homes and businesses in the town, once capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii, decimated. An official cause to what ignited the nation's deadliest wildfire in the last century under investigation. See them right there. That's the line. While clues have emerged pointing to down power lines from extreme high winds, Hawaiian Electric conducting an investigation amid lawsuits filed against them. The state's attorney general office announcing they are working with a third party with experience in emergency management to launch their own probe. More than 100 people did not survive and hundreds more are still unaccounted for. This as more than half of the burn areas have been surveyed. The number of search dogs doubling from 20 to 40 to help speed up the grim recovery effort. As we learn more incredible stories of survival, Randy Cortenman sharing with ABC how he was helping fight the fires while standing on two broken feet. I knew that my feet were in bad shape, but I didn't have time to worry about myself. I go, I can do something. I can help these people. I can put out these fires. I know I can. Three days later, Randy reuniting with his son, who also managed to survive. Governor Josh Green expected to make an address later today amid concerns about the future of the island's economy as Maui heavily relies on tourism. To be able for us to survive, we need tourism. We need to make money too. Hotspots and some smoldering fires continue to burn on the island of Maui as firefighters are still working to fully contain all of the blazes that sparked last week. Melissa Adan, ABC News, Maui. Check out traffic right now. I want to go back to the scene where there was a grass fire a few hours ago. This is 35 at New Laredo Highway. You can see still some smoke off to the right on the access road there, and you can see Fire crews are out there making sure those hot spots don't become more than that. But again, this is I-35 at New Laredo Highway. And if you have plans this weekend, a major road closure could get in the way. Part of Loop 1604 on the north side will be closed. RJ Marquez has a look at that closure and how to get around it. Well, we have already seen a ton of construction on the north side, and we're going to get a lot more headaches this week for drivers in that area. We are talking about a major closure that's going to be taking place here for drivers there. Loop 1604 at the Northwest Military Highway intersection. So this is going to be all shut down. Uh, we're going to start this construction here starting tonight at 9 p.m., and this is now going to run through Monday. At at 5 a.m. Originally it was going to be Sunday, but now we're running to Monday 5 a.m. So this is just going to be a big mess around the area. What they're doing is they're bringing in some beams for the bridge there over Northwest Military Highway. So let's explain a little bit what exactly is going to be going on. You see some of the arrows there. So basically drivers there on the westbound main lanes from Blanco Road, they're going to have to exit there uh, right before the Northwest Military Highway entrance ramp because there's going to be also some drainage crossing work that's going to be done in that area. So westbound traffic is going to be the exit from Blanco all the way to Northwest Military Highway, that's going to be all shut off there and you're going to have to detour in that area. Okay, how about the eastbound traffic there? What we're looking at here is again the Northwest Military Highway exit ramps to the Northwest Military Highway entrance ramps. That's going to be shut down there. Again, a little bit of a shorter closure there for drivers heading eastbound. Westbound, it's going to extend all the way from Northwest Military Highway to Blanco Road. Eastbound, we're looking at Northwest Military Highway to West Bitters Road. So again, this is going to be taking place here tonight at 9 p.m. and going through Monday at 5 a.m. Again, try and avoid the area if at all possible. Make sure you stay safe and they may also have some officers out there directing traffic as well. So again, just stay safe, avoid the area and hopefully you guys have a good weekend. And thank you, RJ, for that update. We almost did it today. So far, 104, the high temperature. That's one degree shy of the record. I say so far because between now and 6 o'clock, we could still make it to 105. The average high, by the way, 96. We're feeling the heat, more of the same all across the board. Eagle Pass, Tally's backyard, 104, along with Panamaria, Maria. Floresville, 105. Windcrest, 102. New Braunfels in Michael's backyard at 104 degrees. So we're all feeling the triple digits right now. As we go through the evening, 8 o'clock still at 100. 10 o'clock, we're down to 93. And by midnight, 88 degrees. That southeasterly wind picks up a little bit, up to 15 miles per hour, and the humidity increases. But there is a weather pattern shift next week. Not quite as hot for temperatures and an update on the chance of rain, that tropical energy that's moving into the Gulf on the latest in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Speaking of weather, coming up next, Hurricane Hillary out in the Pacific Ocean, moving full steam ahead towards the southwest coast. Many in California being told to brace for possible flooding. 
Plus, the wildfires in Canada are having people flee their homes looking for safety. The latest on the destruction. Stay ahead of the storm. Coming up at six, we cover the essential steps to ensure your safety in the face of a disaster. A look at what basic items you should keep in your home and in your vehicle right now. The killer of a Wilson County deputy has died in prison. Bittersweet relief for a dispatch supervisor who went into law enforcement to honor their grandfather. That story coming up at six. Now, Hurricane Hillary churning in the Pacific Ocean, taking aim at Mexico before it's expected to hit Southern California as a tropical storm. And its development comes as extreme weather also affects people up in Canada. Yeah, ABC's Rena Roy has the latest on thousands of people fleeing as hundreds of wildfires continue to burn. For the first time ever, a tropical storm watch issued for California as Hurricane Hillary churns off the Mexican coast and heads north. Right now, it's it's a hurricane, although it's projected to when it hits us to be a tropical storm. People bracing for heavy rain, flash flooding, gusty winds and possibly even tornadoes. Southern California has seen tropical storms and their impacts from them. But the last time a tropical storm made this kind of track over Southern California was back in 1997. The storm will likely make landfall in Mexico on Sunday and weaken as it approaches the U.S. border. Places like Los Angeles, San Diego and Las Vegas expected to be hit hard and rare to historic flooding is possible for the deserts. We could see a, a year's worth of rain in places like Palm Spring or Las Vegas, some of those mountain areas uh, in just a couple of days. Meanwhile, further north in Canada, thousands of people evacuated from their homes with multiple wildfires burning across the country. Fire crews and water bombers trying to save the city of Yellowknife, the capital city of Canada's Northwest Territories. A massive wildfire forcing an evacuation order for the entire population, about 20,000 people. It's just black and it's smoldering, right? So there's you know, it's just like just smoke kind of coming up out of the ground. Some waiting in long lines for emergency flights, others driving hundreds of miles to safety. Canada is currently in its worst fire season on record, and there are no signs of it easing up. Right now, there are more than a thousand active fires burning across the country. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Meantime, back here at home, we're going to take a live look at her picture here over the San Antonio airport. 104 degrees went down a degree. Oh, this there you go. Just a few minutes ago, <laughs> but we're watching for rain. We are. We're looking for rain. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm actually losing confidence in us uh, getting much in terms of rainfall. So let's get right to the updated rain chances here and notice that's maximum at 30% on Tuesday. There's still the chance for this to shift. There's a lot of time between now and then, especially considering we're trying to predict a system that really hasn't come together much. And so that adds an extra complexity to it. But this all starts in the tropics. First of all, way on the Atlantic, we have three systems we're watching 30%, 40%, and 60% chance of development. They're all basically headed to the northeast into the or to the northwest, I should say, into the Atlantic. But what we're watching and focusing on is this cluster of thunderstorms. That's all this is right now. Literally just a cluster of storms, rainfall, lightning and thunder associated with it. And that's moving into the Bahamas. This, the National Hurricane Center now has at a 40% chance of developing into a tropical depression as it moves into the Gulf of Mexico. It is very unorganized. If it was organized. I would say this baby's going to strengthen quickly, but it's very unorganized. It's having a hard time getting its act together. There is that off chance that it could. Bottom line, it's just going to throw some moisture our way. That's still what it looks, at least moisture toward Texas. So there's the ripple in the upper level flow. That's what this is. It's an upper level disturbance right now, and that's what it's most likely going to be as we get into Sunday and even Monday as it moves in the Gulf and notice the big blue H the upper level high over Iowa. That means the steering flow moves this disturbance toward Texas. The doors open for some energy. I do think better rain chances are farther south of San Antonio. The farther south you are from San Antonio, the higher your odds and notice this future cast keeping that rain to the south. I'm showing you this. This is the most consistent computer model over the past several days. Uh, most of the runs have been pretty consistent on keeping the bulk of the rain, if not all of it, south of San Antonio. 
Again, this can change, but this is one reason why I'm losing confidence that as we're getting a little bit closer, there's been some consistency, at least in one of the models and a little more of a trend starting to develop. We're going to keep you updated. The forecast is going to continue to change. I can guarantee you that. So check back for the latest 20 consecutive 100 degree days. Tomorrow makes 21, which ties the all time record. 78 in the morning, 95 at noon, 104 the high on your Saturday. 104 Stinson, Pleasanton 105, Comfort 101, New Braunfels 105, and then pretty much the same on Sunday. Hot, dry, high fire danger. I'm going to show you the fire danger map from the Texas A&M Forest Service coming up at 6 o'clock. But look at this. We are predicting still to drop into the upper 90s by Tuesday and Wednesday. And that's the break. That's the brief right. break. Yeah, Two-day break. All right. Football time, Reagan Rattlers. Yep, Reagan Rattlers. They're going to be one of the big dogs this season in 28-6A. In fact, they're predicted to win that district championship. Plus, does Dak understand Coach McCarthy when it comes to calling the plays? Coming up. We are one week away from big game coverage taking over football stadiums around the area as we continue our BGC previews with the Reagan Rattlers. Led by head coach Lyndon Hamilton, the Rattlers went 8-3 overall last season with a perfect 8-0 mark in district. They lost in the first round of the playoffs. They are ranked 44th in the state in Class 6A per Dave Campbell's Texas football, and they are predicted to win the district 28-6A title ahead of Johnson and Brandeis. Reagan has 14 starters coming back. That's seven on each side of the ball. Now, many feel the Rattlers will make some noise this year, and they're cool with that I think that everybody that believes that is right because I think we have all the talent in the world we just need to really lock in as a team and listen to what our coaches have been saying I think we can get a lot done this year I mean yeah it's our like third year playing together now so we're really excited to see how much we've grown from last year since we were sophomores and juniors now gotten bigger stronger so we're excited about that you know we're taking it day by day and we're living in the now the, the word of, of the year right now is just living the now and uh, they're doing a great job day in and day out you know we've had you know, two six day work weeks back to back. You couldn't tell which day was, you know, a Monday or a Friday. And so uh, the, the coaches, you know, great energy and, and it's feeding into the kids and the kids are feeding into the coaches. And it's just a, everybody talks about culture, but every day this deal is just we continue to climb that mountain. Coach Hamilton and his Rattlers will open the season a week from today, 7 p.m. at the Smithson Valley Rangers. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys have two more preseason games left to evaluate talent and work on plays before the games start to count early September. Entering his eighth season with the Cowboys, quarterback Dak Prescott is working hard with offensive coordinator Brian Schottenheimer and head coach Mike McCarthy, who will call the offensive plays this season. Following practice yesterday, Dak was asked if he has an understanding of what McCarthy is trying to do. Uh, yeah, I've got a great idea and then just being able to be on the headset uh, in this first game in the preseason and just the tempo and the pace that he's getting them in. Um, it's exciting. And so, yeah, the more that the more that I get to see that and the more we talk throughout the week, uh, I think that, yeah, we'll be in the same um, same realm of, of the mindset of when a play is coming in, knowing exactly what's coming, what's expected and allowing us to play fast and uh, play to our strengths. After practice yesterday, the boys' final one in Oxnard, Dak played rock, paper, scissors with that fan, and he also signed autographs. The boys left for Seattle today, where they'll face the Seahawks tomorrow night. We'll be right back after the break.